we continue with the section entitled Small Catechism. What is the Sixth Commandment? You we shall, shall not, not commit adultery. adultery. What does this mean? We, we should, should fear and love God, God so, so that we lead a sexually pure and decent life in what we say and do, and husband and wife love and honor each other. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. This passage we read from the Gospels a moment ago. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and have an inheritance. And they took him, and threw him out of the vineyard killed him. So far the text. Please be seated. If you're anything like me, you often find yourselves judging the people in Scripture with the phrase, gosh, they're a lot worse than me. I empathize with that, and I even try to excuse myself, only to realize I can't do it, because I'm the one that put Jesus on the cross. I'm the one that nailed him there. I'm the one that killed him. Had he not died, I would not have hope and a future. And because he died and rose, there is now laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which no one can take away. So I thought, because not many of us have vineyards to which we've sent servants, who've been mugged, beaten, thrown out, even killed, and then sent a child of mine only to be similarly horribly treated, I thought, let's take a look at sins in a way that is more relatable to us, while at the same time recognizing that we all are under the law. While we may say, and it's certainly true, even scripture would agree, look, would you rather have somebody hate you or kill you? I'll take hate because I'm still alive, right? We get this. But ultimately, the way God looks at sin is, if you miss on the least point of the law, you miss heaven if you don't have Jesus. So, we'll start with a piece. I hope this works. This is from Australia, a school district. Uh, the staff voted unanimously to record their school telephone answer machine. This is the actual machine then, the, and what it says. And this came about because they required students and parents to be responsible for the kids to finish their homework. And they were being sued by the parents and teachers who wanted their grades upgraded and then passed, even though they'd missed 15 to 30 times during the semester each. Ring! Imagine the ring. Click. Hello. You've reached the automated answering service of your school. In order to assist you in connecting you to the right staff member, please listen to all the options before making your choice. To lie about why your child's absent, press 1. To make excuses for why your child did not do his homework, press 2. To complain about what we do, press 3. To swear at staff members, press 4. To ask why you didn't get information that's already being enclosed in a newsletter that's been mailed to you, press 5. If you want us to raise your child, press 6. If you want to reach out and touch, slap, or hit someone, press 7. To request another teacher for the third time this year, press 8. To complain about bus transportation, press 9. To complain about school lunches, press 0. 
If you realize this is the real world, then your child must be accountable for his or her behavior, classwork, and homework, and it's not the teacher's fault for your child's lack of effort, please hang up and have a nice day. If you want this in another language, move to a country that speaks it. Thank you for your interest in public education. This is the actual message at the Morungalua School in Australia. Believe it or not, it's a symptomatic of one of the sins of our times. I mean, I can't imagine. I'll pick on Pastor Nielsen. And if I drop dead, by the way, you're in good shape because he's here, so ready to go. So, would your parents ever have called school and say to the school with a lie that you're absent for some supposedly good reason? Would that ever have happened? Would they ever have let you get away with not doing your homework just because you had a cold? You see my point. Lord have mercy. What a world we come to. Uh, John, later on, don't let me forget my phone because I'm terribly forgetful. Enough of that. Here's one that maybe uh, hits close to home for some of us. My dear wife and I have uh, fathers in heaven, both who live to the mid-90s. We have mothers who are a hundred and hers and ninety-nine, mine, and still remarkably resilient. So this is a story about someone that says, today, as my father, three brothers, and two sisters stood around my mother's hospital bed, my mother uttered the last coherent words before she died. She simply said, feel so loved right now. We should have gotten together like this more often. I remember going to visit a patient twice a week in Saskatchewan. I thought she was all alone, had no one, and she wasn't very communicative. So I had no idea what her family situation was like. All of a sudden, she's near death. I counted them. There were 22 people in her room. They all lived, the furthest one, 11 miles. Lord have mercy on my soul. If that isn't something that gets the goat of God, I don't know what it is. And maybe, why am I sharing these? Maybe some of these you can relate to as things that maybe you need to work on yourself. And then, of course, there's politics. I don't want to get too far into politics, but I will say that as is my habit, and has been my habit ever since I became a pastor, we pray for the President of the United States, regardless of who that person is. And we will do so today. And it burdens me that there are those who say they can't wait until he dies. Or for that matter, who attack Amy Coney Barrett for the fact that she adopted black children to show that somehow she is the master of race. Lord have mercy on my soul. But unfortunately, today, We've regressed to a make-believe world where there are 63 genders. By the way, only <laughs> six years ago, there were 28, according to National Geographic, but I guess there are 63 now. And this is old. There's probably one more. Um, menstrual cycles for men. A world that includes falsehoods about sexual liberation, abortion. Legalized marijuana, pornography, assisted suicide, divorce, transgenderism, and many more. I call it darkness, but the world calls much of this as perfectly good stuff. And look, let's make a distinction. There are things that are contrary to the law of God, which transcends the law of man. But, thankfully, we are Lutheran. We believe, as Scripture declares, there are two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of man, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, 
And there's the kingdom of God. And to God, what is God's? Makes sense. So, look, if you want to make a law that says it's okay for there to be a bond of some kind that is legal in the eyes of the law of man, that two men should be connected in every way, or two women, I mean, that's not our kingdom. That's the kingdom of the left. That's the kingdom of man. If they want to make such a rule, okay. But it's not God's. We need to understand. The same goes with marijuana. The same goes with pornography, most of which, all of this is legal, except child pornography, but we're toning it down, right? We want younger and younger kids to be able to be employed in the sex business. Lord have mercy. So look, I don't really need to go any further to tell you that there are problems in the world, that we perhaps are part of the problem, and it reminds me of how much we take for granted sometimes the gift of God in Jesus Christ, who gives us the inheritance that is referred to in the gospel today, an inheritance that is imperishable, that cannot be taken away. And ultimately we know this truth, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Savior and Lord. And we know that that day will come. And whether we are still alive when the day comes or not, we will stand before him and he will one more time. This is curious. <clears throat> I mean, look, he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. And here's one of my favorite things about that. So just for a moment, pretend <laughs> and really pretend uh, that I'm Jesus just for illustration's sake. Okay. So he says those at his right hand, right? He will bring to heaven. Those on his left are going to the other place. But which is his right and which is his left? Is this his right? Or is this his right? And since the Bible doesn't say, I think on the last day we're all going to be worried. And then there's this, which is why I make the point. There will be one last time. He may not ask it precisely in this fashion, but there will be one last moment before even those who enter heaven into the promised inheritance of the gospel. When you are essentially asked, why should I let you into heaven? And don't you dare say, but I'm Chuck. Look at, I set this up, man. Without this, we can't be broadcasting to the universe. I'm Kevin. I'm the protector of mankind. I'm Nielsen, the retired pastor with years of experience and with a lovely bride who looks much too young for me. All these things. No, none of that's going to matter. There is one thing that matters. Nothing to thy cross I bring only to thy cross I cling. You and I are the inheritors of that promise. We may not be able to identify real well with people willing to beat people up and even kill them to keep the vineyard. contributed a lot to the mocking, to the whipping and scourging, to the stripes, to the derision, to the walking up to Golgotha, to the nailing, and to the agonizing death of him who loved us so much that he gave his life unto death 
that we might have life and have it everlasting and free. You and I are the light of the world. And boy, the world needs it. I don't know about you, but it seems to me the world has gotten a little darker lately. In lots of ways. In ways I could not have imagined as a proud German immigrant coming to this great country of America where the streets are paved in gold. And as far as I was concerned, they were paved in gold. They didn't have bomb holes in them. They had toilets that worked. They had buildings that were intact. Now, where I came from, we didn't have any of that. But things are changing. Not necessarily for the better. Is it possible at a time like this, a gospel like this, reminding us that we have an inheritance in Jesus Christ, would allow us to come to grips with who we are when we make our confession on Sunday morning as we just did to say, Lord, forgive me for I am a sinner. And then rest in the grace of God, which is in Jesus Christ, who declares to us, today, today, I am with you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. I don't know about you, but I suspect maybe you're like me. I can use that kind of reassurance. And there's a world out there screaming about all kinds of things. And their ultimate assurance is not in the things of this world, nor in political power, nor in gaining a false inheritance, but it is only and always in the precious name of Jesus and in crucified and risen. In his name we pray and speak.